This is a brief lecture about Emily Dickinson. Dickinson lived from 1830 to 1886. Almost unknown as a poet in her lifetime, Emily Dickinson is now recognized as one of America's greatest poets and in the view of some as one of the greatest lyric poets of all times. Dickinson was the middle child of Edward and Emily Dickinson. She was born on December 10, 1830, in Amherst, Massachusetts. Her formal schooling was exceptional for girls in the early 19th century, though not unusual for girls in Amherst. After a short time at an Amherst district school, she attended Amherst Academy for about seven years before entering Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. She stayed at the seminary for one year, the longest time she spent away from home. In youth, Dickinson had quite a social flair. She enjoyed the company of others and had many friends, both female and male. It is said that at least one uh, young man did propose marriage to her, but she never married. Her youthful years were not without turmoil. Deaths of friends and relatives, including one young cousin, prompted questions about death and immortality. From the house where she lived, she could see the nearby cemetery, and Dickinson could not have ignored the frequent burials that later provided powerful image, imagery for her poems. A wave of religious revivals in Dickinson's teen years addressed her Calvinist society's concern for the disposition of the human soul. Although Dickinson's friends, sister, father, and eventually brother all joined the church, she never did. She said about herself, I am one of the lingering bad ones. Her lively childhood and youth were filled with schooling, reading, explorations of nature, religious activities, significant friendships, and several key encounters with poetry. Her most intense writing years consumed the decade of her late 20s and early 30s. During that time, she composed almost 1,100 of her 1,800 poems. She made few attempts to publish her work, choosing instead to share them privately with family and friends. In her later years, Dickinson increasingly withdrew from public life. Her garden, her family, and her brother's family, and a few close friends occupied her time. With a few exceptions, her poetry remained virtually unpublished until after she died on May 15, 1886. After her death, her poems and life story were brought to the attention of the wider world through the competing efforts of family members and intimates. Let's take a moment to look at the poetic style and poetic devices Dickinson used, beginning with theme and tone. Like most writers, Emily Dickinson wrote about what she knew and about what intrigued her. A keen observer, she used images from nature, religion, law, music, commerce, medicine, fashion, and domestic activities to probe universal themes. Sometimes with humor, sometimes with pathos, Dickinson wrote about her subjects. Remembering that she had a strong wit may help you to understand some of her themes. As for form and style, Dickinson's poems are lyrics, generally defined as short poems with a single speaker who expresses a significant thought or feeling, generally as one isolated thought or feeling, rather than many. As in most lyric poetry, the speaker in Dickinson's poems is often identified in the first person, I, but we should never confuse ourselves and believe that that I is Emily Dickinson herself. Like just about all of Dickinson's poems, uh, the poems that you will read today have no titles. Emily Dickinson titled fewer than 10 of her almost 1,800 poems. So now, her poems are generally known by their first lines or by numbers assigned to them by posthumous editors. It's my belief that we should title the poems by that first line and not give editors the job of titling poetry. For some of Dickinson's poems, more than one manuscript version exists as well, which makes it interesting for the student of Emily Dickinson's poetry. The meter or the rhythm of the poems is usually determined by the syllables in a line and how the syllables are accented. Dickinson's verse is often associated with common meter, which is defined by alternating lines of eight syllables and six syllables. 
In common meter, the syllables usually alternate between unstressed and stressed. This pattern, one of several types of metrical feet, is known as an I am. Common meter is often used in sung music, especially hymns. If you think about Amazing Grace, um, you'll think about the common meter. However, as Kristen Miller writes in Reading in Time, Emily Dickinson and the 19th Century, Emily Dickinson experimented with a variety of metrical and stanzaic forms, including short meter, ballad stanzas, and so forth. And even in common meter, she was not always strictly, uh, she did not always strictly adhere to the rules of that meter. As for rhyme, Dickinson's employment of rhyme is experimental and often not exact. Rhyme that is not perfect is called slant rhyme or approximate rhyme, and these are found throughout her poetry. Punctuation and syntax are also an interesting thing to look at when you're thinking about Dickinson's poetry. Dickinson most often punctuated her poems with dashes, rather than the more expected array of periods, commas, and other punctuation marks. She also capitalized interior words, not just words at the beginning of a line. And it's not always entirely clear as to why she did so. Both the use of dashes and the use of capitals to stress and personify common nouns were condoned by the grammar text that Mount Holyoke Female Seminary adopted and that Dickinson undoubtedly studied from, but she also used those dashes as bridges between not um, apparently uh, connected ideas. With diction as well, it's interesting to study Dickinson's poetry. Her word choice is quite often what you find she has changed from one poem to another. We don't know why sometimes she made those changes. And as we know, since she did not purposefully publish many of her poems, um, the diction was up to her, and which one of the, the different versions of the poetry to be studied is up to us. Now let's talk about Dickinson's themes. Dickinson uh, presents many themes in her nearly 1,800 poems. As you can imagine, it'd be very difficult to write that many poems and not to deal with a lot of different ideas, subjects, and themes. One of the themes is the inner world. In many of Dickinson's poems, she looks at the inner world of our psychological state. She looks into the minds of the, of the speaker or speakers. Some examples that are very famous are poems like, I felt a funeral in my brain, and it was not death, for I stood up, or I felt a cleaving in my mind. Um, very richly uh, influenced by the psychological studies of the time, she quite often looked into the psychology of the characters or the speakers in her poems. Death is one of the main themes in Dickinson's poetry, and it's found very often in her poetry. She held the common Puritan belief that the way a person died indicated the state of his or her soul, and a peaceful death meant grace and harmony with God. You'll see her characters personifying death, and you'll also see her characters dealing with their own deaths in many cases. Nature is a source, source of joy and beauty, which can, without warning and without obvious cause, become threatening and dangerous. It's at time connected with death, perceived as renewing, or characterized as indifferent to humanity. And all the different aspects of nature can be found in the poetry of Emily Dickinson. Pain and separation also, love, God, and religion, these themes are prevalent in the poetry of Emily Dickinson. And as you read the poems that are in your textbook or that you find online in the many different um, poetic poetry anthologies, I think you'll discover that you'll find poems that fit every one of these themes. Let's look at an example of a poetry about life, or a poem about life, excuse me. This poem is Success is Counted Sweetest, and it's one of Emily Dickinson's most famous poems. I've taken it here from the collection called Complete Poems that was published in 1924. Uh, you'll notice that several years after Emily Dickinson's death. Uh, this collection of complete poems is divided by theme. And so in the life section, you see this poem. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend the nectar requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he defeated dying 
on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph break agonized and clear. We see several things here that we've just talked about as far as the poetic devices of Dickinson. First of all, this is a lyric poem. It's a brief poem expressing one specific emotion or one specific point. Notice, too, that we see um, those rhymes and near rhymes at the ends of the lines. If you look at the first verse, sweetest succeed, nectar need, uh, there's the A, B, C, B rhyme scheme here. And if you go on through, you'll notice that it doesn't clearly exactly follow that rhyme scheme, but instead that the rhymes change with the ideas of the poetry. Note, too, that success is in all caps. There are no dashes in this particular poem, but there is the use of that capitalization that um, lets you see there's a real emphasis here on that word. The theme of the poem is stated in the first line, success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. And of course we all know, those of us who are striving to be successful, see success as something so much more than those who have reached that point, the pinnacle, so to speak. There are some um, uses of military imagery here, the purple host, the, the ones who take the flag, uh, those who reach victory, these are all military terms. We also have the defeated person and hearing the last strains of the battle. And so there's, it's almost like a war, a battle, that this person who wants success so much that they're fighting so hard for, and um, the ones who are successful, once again, when they've reached the victory, they don't realize how precious the price is as those who have not. There is a lot more to see in this poem. And I want you to read it and see what you can see from the poem. Here is an example of a nature poem by Dickinson, A Bird Came Down the Walk. Once again, you'll see some of the things we've just talked about, some of the use of rhythm and rhyme. The, um, it's a lyric poem once again this time. Uh, this, the subject matter is a natural matter, that of the bird. Here's a love poem called Wild Nights, Wild Nights. Uh, once again, you see some of those, those same things that we've been talking about, but much more. And then finally, here is Time and Eternity. Now these are four of the, or this, here is a Time and Eternity poem, I'm sorry, called I Never Lost As Much But Twice. Now these are just four examples of Emily Dickinson's poetry. There are many, many more, several in the Norton Anthology of American Literature many online that you may find. But these are some suggestions for you to begin with, to read Emily Dickinson's poetry and to get an idea of what you think about her poetry and what you want to know more about.